Welcome to 20 Minutes with a Scientist. We are very excited to have you here with us today. A special welcome to you if you're watching the replay. And I want to give a quick shout out to those who are watching live. Welcome to Zara, to Queen Donut, King Husky, Science, uh, Mom, Science Amber. Mom Amber. Thank you for moderating in the chat for us on YouTube. Zara, Spino. And we today are going to be talking a little bit about visualizations and how we see the world. And before I introduce our guest, I want to try a little thought experiment. So this is especially for you, Math Dad. All right, I'm ready. So you know that our body is made up of cells. And what do you think True. is inside a cell? Can you tell me what the inside of a cell is like? I, I know it's made of cytoplasm with organelles inside, like you got like mitochondria and the nucleus and ribosomes and other, other and in, inside there's like DNA and stuff, but I, I, I can't say I've ever seen a good picture of a cell that I, it gave me a lot of feeling. You've probably for... seen a lot of diagrams. So yeah. we know there's there's fluid inside a cell, and then the cell has structure, right? The cell has this structure of like an internal, kind of like a, a scaffold that helps things to move around. I'm going to show you a short little clip, and then I want to ask you, does this change how you think of cells? So this is a very realistic rendition of what a cell looks like on the inside, and in particular, it shows us what it looks like when we have, I'm gonna scoot back here just a little bit. Oh, I gotta find my favorite part. My favorite part, I may, oh, here it is. This, by vesicles traveling along the this wait, wait, wait. is a vesicle. It is a membrane that has proteins in it and it's traveling along a microtubule. It's, it's walking? It is walking uh, with the help of these motor proteins. Okay, that, that, that looks now, like an alien. Like, like like some sci-fi movie. It looks pretty crazy, doesn't it? Oh, and you know what? I just realized I pushed play on the wrong video. That is why it wasn't in my favorite spot. And this is the joy of a live stream, you guys. You get to see that even Math Dad and Science Mom make mistakes. So here we go. Now we're gonna see the real deal. <laughs> yeah. So. Whoa! It's like it's got a. The motor proteins, I mean, it almost like it's and nose walking or on something. Legs. Yeah, yeah. And this is the scaffolding of the cell. See those filaments that are helping to give it structure? Whoa. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pause this and then introduce our guest because I have to tell you, the first time that I saw this video, I it's called The Inner Life of the Cell, and I'll have a link in the description of the video so you can watch the whole thing if you would like, but it changed the way that I viewed biology completely and I was just entranced and fascinated and so without further ado we are going to bring on Dr. Robert Liu. Rob teaches at Harvard University. He's a professor of cellular and molecular biology and he was one of the main people who was instrumental in bringing this video to life. So everyone in the chat give a warm welcome to Rob. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to join you this morning. Yeah, we're very happy to have you. And I want to give just a quick hello to a couple of the um, people who have joined us. So we have Amy, um, we have Nathan, Daniel in Michigan, and um, Deepa, Farah from Virginia. So we have people watching from all over the US right now. And Rob, I would love for you to tell our audience how you became a scientist. So maybe take just a minute to share what got you into science. Well, so, you know, unsurprisingly, lots of folks that end up in science and particularly biology start off with a love of nature. So I grew up in Jamaica. I was born and raised in Jamaica, the island, not Jamaica, New York. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say being surrounded by nature and going to a small high school that really didn't have any resources, but we had to try and use sort of the nature that was around us to understand biology was really important for me in terms of understanding just how exciting it is to really explore how the living world works. So it really got started from my environment, I'd say, as a child. Oh, I love that. We, we're, we're running an animal camp next week, and one of the main goals is to help kids get outside. And if they're not able to get outside, to just showcase some of the incredible biology that's all around us, you know, from insects to larger animals. You're speaking to the right audience here, though. The, yes. the crew that's been t tuning in is just so excited about science and learning. So you, you grew up in in Jamaica, and then how did you make it to Harvard University? Tell us just a little bit about your professional career. Ah, oh, well, so <clears throat> it was one of those things where, um, so I was the first to go to college in my family, 
And so it was something of an adventure to try to figure out, well, first, what college looked like. And I don't know how many of you out there can imagine this. When I was thinking about college, there wasn't the internet. <laughs> I didn't have like, YouTube, I didn't have science mom and math dad to help me think about things. I mean, I had to like ride away to the US to get like little pamphlets and make a decision if I wanted to go to college. So it was something of an adventure. But when I finally went to college in the US, um, a small college in Worcester, Massachusetts, one of the first things I did, because I was interested in biology, is that I approached um, a faculty member, a professor named Mary Lee Ledbetter. I didn't know anything about working in the lab or anything like that. And I said, you're doing stuff with cells. Well, first of all, what are cells? And also, can I work in your lab? Zero experience. First semester freshman year. And oh, she wow. said, come on in. And so when she showed me cells in the microscope, I fell in love with them. And that was really how my, my relationship with cells really began. It's thanks to Mary Lee, no question that, about it. That is neat. And I've got to ask, the first time that you looked through a microscope, was that as a freshman at college? Yes, yes. Wow. Yes, in terms of one where I could actually see with some clarity what was going on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is neat. Yeah. And I believe you have, um, I, th I think you have uh, some video and footage to show us. And so I'm going to. Well, right, right. Just to sort of give you a sense of what I, because, you know, in high school, I'd seen like, and we've all seen those um, histology slides. Yeah. But in college, I was able to see what living cells look like. And so this isn't actually what I saw, but in fact, it's the same cell type, right? So these are cells called um, keratinocytes. They exist in the outer surface of our skin. And one of their characteristics is that they crawl, they move. Right, and so that is literally in a light microscope what those look like. And so mm -hmm. that was in many regards what inspired me to really think about how to express what the cell looks like and really how the cell works. That is amazing. So when you looked through the microscope, you were able to see living cells actually moving like yes. that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. yes, it was really, ex and to think that that's going on, frankly, with those cell types, it's all over our skin. We're literally crawling. With <laughs> and they're really important though. They're not creepy because those cells help our wounds heal. So when you get a scratch, those cells reorient and all crawl into the wound and help patch it, literally. Wow, that is amazing. So we've got some interesting comments in the chat. Some people are really amazed by that and other people are a little grossed out. I think you just kind of need your mind. <laughs> yeah. We're crawling with those. It's, a, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah. That is incredible, especially because, and, and I think in one of my science classes, I was told that our out, outer layer of skin is dead. You know, that you're just right. covered in dead cells that are sloughing off. But yeah. it, is that is there any truth to that or is it a mixture? Well, no, it's uh, so that the very outermost layers are dead. Those are cells that gradually over time die and form this thick barrier, which is so critical for us. Uh -huh. But ultimately, but just below that, there are there are many living cells and there's a lot of motility. So like, yeah. for example, you know, we tend to think of our, our immune system as just being in the bloodstream. In fact, there are cells from our immune system that are crawling through all of our tissues. They're kind of the security guards that are surveying our body. And if anything looks wrong, they attack it, right? If there's any invader that they can recognize, they attack it. So we have a whole army that's crawling around all of our tissues, not just our skin. Allison says that is so awesome, and I completely agree. Now, I want to ask you a little bit about the the visualization that we showed right at the beginning that I shared with Math Dad, because both of us agreed that that was one of the most incredible depictions of the, sh the cell that we'd seen. So how did the inner life of the cell video come about, and can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so my colleagues and I did this in 2005, so long ago. Right, in 2005, and, and I have to admit, one of the reasons why I did this is that I have to confess, I'm actually, a, I love film, <laughs> and I'm kind of a closet film director. Ooh. And what I found is that many animations were very cold. You know, science animations mm -hmm. were very cold, and I wanted to do something that had a filmic quality, where there's drama, there's music, there's a sense of a story of an arc that happens. And so this was an opportunity to do this. And the Howard Hughes Medical Institute funded me to do this. Um, 
And so this was like the first animation that a colleague of mine, Alain Viel, and I did, did together. Um, and so it was something that really, really allowed us to explore how do we represent these things. And mm -hmm. one thing about being a cell biologist, you need to project in your mind how things look, right? To pose the questions, to design the experiments, you kind of have a picture of things in your head. But yeah. I wanted to almost give everyone a sense of what's going on in a cell biologist's head and how mm -hmm. we examine things. And so that's kind of the story that we created. And since then, we have continued to do a sort of a variety of animations with lots of folks. Excellent. And whoops, I'm going to have us be here for the side real quick. And then um, I, I would love to play just a little bit more of this and maybe have you tell us, tell us just a bit more as, as it plays. Right, so one thing I'd, I'd recommend for viewers is that BioVisions itself is on um, labexchange.org. So you can actually see lots of animations that we've done. But, um, but, but in terms of the one that's particularly well known, let me turn off the audio here. So I mean, with this one, what we're really trying to do, so by the way, those um, cells that are, are trawling your body, this is an example of one, that's a leukocyte, right? So it's rolling on the walls, of your blood vessels. So a white blood cell. It can attach to the walls of your blood vessels. These are some of the proteins in the surface. And what's fascinating about these cells is that if you have an infection, they're able to chemically recognize that something's wrong in the tissue surrounding a blood vessel. And then if I fast forward to here, what happens is that they change their connections with the walls mm -hmm. of your blood vessels and then literally they change shape. Oh, wow. And they squeeze in between two of those endothelial cells, and they literally go out into your tissue to fight the infection. <laughs> right? So, right. So, so, so this was really something we felt was exciting to show. But there's also something that's important, right? Like any film, when you look at the interior, with any film, you need to think about what is the point you're trying to make. And so the cell is actually much more packed than that. So we did another animation to give you a sense of just how super crowded the environment of the cell is. Take a look at this one. Oh. Oh, wow. so we're about to dive into this cell and you'll start to see just how packed with proteins the interior of the cell is. So we're going through the membrane now. Yes. And we're starting to look at some proteins we'll take a look at. But everything is jittering because of thermal motion, because of heat. But look at how crowded wow. the environment is. It's completely packed. And in <laughs> fact, that's how things happen because things are so close to each other and thanks to heat, they're all jiggling around. So do you remember we showed um, that scene where the, the vesicle is being dragged along? Yeah. This is also a vesicle, but it's showing it in the packed environment. So this is literally how packed the environment of the cell is. So what? it is super crowded. And what you should know is all of these structures, the vast majority of them, we know the three-dimensional structures. So that is literally, structurally, what those components look like. But, um, and Amy says it's so colorful, but I have to point out, in real life, if you were able to be this small and visualize it, would you see colors like this? No, or no, because, it? yeah, the structures are too small. So they're below the wavelengths of light that would allow you to see color. So with <laughs> all of these things, these are representations where we use color to highlight. Yeah. So for example, with the first um, animation that we did, the, the Inner Life, I remember working with the animation team, they said to me, well, what sort of colors are we looking at? And I sort of chose, I said, well, we're not looking at color, but here are the colors we'll use. I chose colors and I said to them, I want this to look like a coral reef in the tropics. Oh, I love it. And what's funny is I heard this years ago, talking with years later, talking at folks um, at Pixar, that if you look at the inner life of the cell and you look at certain scenes of Finding Nemo, they actually look quite similar. Uh -huh. And some of the animators at Finding Nemo, ironically, 
were inspired by the inner life of the cell. <laughs> oh, that's of the colors they chose for certain things. So it's it's kind of like a weird circle. Nice. Right? Um, in some ways, in terms of how color was used. I love that. And um, another question that I had for you, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of truth to the quote, to see is to understand. Absolutely. But what does what does seeing mean in this context? To you? Well, so, yeah, so really what it is, it's, um, Learning very much involves being able to understand visually and then in turn picture it in your mind, mm. right? And so one of the great difficulties we find in cell biology is because everything is so small, it becomes very abstract for students. Mm. So being able to show, so a diagram is a representation, but being able to show them a moving representation that speaks to dynamism, that speaks to multiple processes at once, that speaks to complexity, really helps students picture it in their mind what's happening and that even though these are representations they're really a step closer to reality than a diagram because we really use the actual three-dimensional structures and while things are colorized like for example if you look at those beautiful shots of the universe mm -hmm. and galaxies from nasa they're all colorized right that's not the color yeah. <laughs> of the universe, right? That's not really what it looks like through the Hubble telescope. Um, yeah. It's a translation. But mm -hmm. any visual translation really helps us understand because for the majority of us that are fortunate, fortunate enough to be sighted, we understand the world first from touch and smell and then from sight as our eyes as, uh, as infants actually open up. Yeah. And so it's how we understand the world. I love that. Yeah, in, in the chat, I see we've got a, a teacher who uses this video in her class. So. Ah, I'm so glad to hear that. By the way, so the funny thing about this, that first video, it was originally made for college students, but we really wanted it to be very, um, we really wanted to make sort of, a, a sort of an impact with it. We never realized how broadly it would be used yeah. so several years ago we did a survey of 3000 plus high schools in the united states and 78 percent of them had a biology class that use it and so my one regret with this video because sometimes folk folks ask me why isn't the inner life of the cell at higher resolution mm. it's because in those days 480p was high res <laughs> It's 2005, people. That was a very long time ago. Um, we're sort of, yeah, it, it, we're sort of the Casablanca of, <laughs> of science animations. It was we a long time ago. And I'm still cool. trying to figure out how to redo it in 4K. Ah. Yeah, yeah, the problem is the estimates right now, it's gonna cost 100K to redo it in 4K. Mm. So I need to figure out where I can find that money, yeah. but, um, but I really would like to do it. Because the animation, like for example, this animation was shown as a work of art um, in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 I've been amazed by just how it's taken hold. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite amazing and I'm That's thrilled. That is really neat. We have a couple of great questions in the chat and I wanna make sure we have time for a few of those, but real quick, I would love for you to share what you're currently working on and then maybe, um, yeah, maybe just give a plug if you can for Lab Exchange because I've been so impressed by that platform, and I think our viewers would really like to know about it. Right, right, absolutely. So, so one thing I'm really excited about is so I'll talk about Lab Exchange first, and then talk about what BioVisions is working on right now. Okay. Um, one thing we're figured out, or at least I figured out for a long time now, is that when you're trying to teach something, when you're trying to communicate something, it's it's better to use multiple modalities. It's not just lecturing, it's not just images, it's not just PowerPoint, it's not just video. In some ways, it's exciting to mash things up. Mm -hmm. But they're not platforms in science that allow you, in science teaching that allow you to do that. So labexchange.org is a major project that my colleagues and I have been working on that um, actually went live in January. And Science Mom is on labexchange.org. Yes, the idea is to pull materials together and actually you can create your own online class. So you have things from Harvard X, from Science Mom, from the Welcome Genome Trust, et cetera, et cetera. And you can pull those materials together, create your own private online class, 
add in your own materials, you invite your students to it, and you have a class that you can do. And it's set up so you can combine different kinds of media, text, readings. We have entire textbooks on the platform. So this is something that we think will transform teaching, and it's mm -hmm. completely free. But because we really want a variety of things that are high quality, really engaging, we have things like BioVisions, we have things like Science Mom, so that you can combine it with like readings from a textbook, um, with sort of um, clips from iBiology. You can really bring all of these things together and teach biology for free as um, sort of an online class with questions that you write yourself. But anyway, so that's Lab Exchange that we're really excited about. So do check it out at labexchange.org. It'll be a different way for you to see and use Science Mom. Um, but what I'd like to talk about now maybe is what we're doing, what we're currently working on. And so the animations that we're working on, and we're at a stage where we just have pieces of things. One of the challenges is for people to understand at the cellular level, at the molecular level, how do, how do your muscles actually contract? Mm. How does muscle contraction occur? You know, they're sliding filaments, cytoskeletal filaments. And so this is literally a visualization that shows the array of filaments in all of our muscle cells. These so are if, you, if you were able to zoom in, yes, you know, more than most microscopes can, yes. you would see this is what a muscle exactly. looks like. Exactly. And so many of us that have taught or, or looked at muscle, you see these stripes. Well, these are what these stripes are. And then what we're going to show is how they actually slide relative to, to each other. So if you look at the two gray lines, you see how they came together and now the muscle is relaxing, so they're going apart. But in fact, what's causing all of this, if we were to focus in and zoom on one level, one layer of those fibers, what we see is that it looks like this. And this is how we can actually look at what those fibers actually look like. And here's why sliding occurs, because there are these little levers, these little heads, motor oh, proteins that literally drag them along. <laughs> you know, that's we can spin around those motor proteins three dimensionally. That's literally what they look like. That is scientifically correct. But is this amazing. is how the filaments actually slide because of those little heads binding to those bright purple fibers and sliding them along. That is incredible. And, and it's happening really fast as, as muscles move and contract, am I right? Exactly, very fast. But you have to realize is that there are hundreds of thousands of these that are doing this at once, right? But it's, so it's interesting. That's why, sh because if you think about it logically, when a muscle contracts, it shortens and that provides force. Yeah. But why is it shortening? It's because these filaments are sliding in this very distinct array together. That so I've had to teach this for years in biology. I've had to show diagrams to my students and they're like, okay, I'm still not sure I get it. So we're hoping that in a few months, we'll start from the outside of muscle, go in and you'll literally see how contraction occurs. Yeah, so I mean, it'll really give you an intuition for how this works. And that's the idea. Okay. That is really neat. Blanca yeah. Morales says she loves how detailed the animations are and yeah. the detail is incredible. Yeah, well, so this, I mean, one of the reasons why this has taken so long is that literally what you're seeing is a supercomputer rendering all of the motions of all the molecules with their correct three-dimensional shapes wow. in real time. So one of the reasons why it's taking so long is that literally we're using Harvard supercomputers, a research cluster that's usually used for um, lab research, sort of data analysis, to actually create these images. And so the problem with that is that if there is any glitch in the render, you need to restart the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> and it'll take like two days to render one little sequence. So uh, it's taking us time but it's, um, it's worth it. It'll be worth it. That is really neat. I, I wanna end with just a couple questions from our audience. Michelle oh, asks, what's your favorite part of being a scientist? That's a hard question. We're starting off with yeah, a hard yeah, No, no, it's a, it, so one of my favorite parts is discovery, right? Really discovering something new 
But for me as a scientist, on par with that is the communication of science, mm -hmm. right? Being able to get someone, be it a student in one of my classes, be it someone out there in the public, um, really excited about science. Because science is so woven with our lives and how we think about ourselves, how we think about others, how we make decisions, that for me, the communication of science is hugely important. And so to me, that's very much a part. To me, doing science is communicating science as well. Yeah, I love that. And science communication is so important. I mean, if science happens well, and then you never tell anybody about it, it's almost like it didn't really happen. I know. And I think I have to say, I've been a scientist for a long time. So I've been at the university for 30 years now. And things have changed, right? Scientists decades ago used to focus on just their science, the particular thing that they're studying and looking at. Yeah. Now I think the majority of scientists realize we need to talk about this. We need to share the joy of discovery and share why, it, why it's relevant. So that's why, I mean, when I first heard about Science Mom and we first met, I mean, I have to say the fact that you're transmitting science out there as a mom, as someone who cares about this in the community, I can't thank you enough. Oh, Jenny. thank you. Yeah. And another, another question real quick before we go. Um, Nathan wants to know, do cells have cells for themselves? Ah, no. Okay. So cells are the smallest unit of life. So cells don't have cells. Cells have components like, or like organelles, etc., structural elements. But in fact, the, one of the major discoveries was the discovery that we're made up of cells, but that's as small as we go, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of a living thing, cells are the smallest unit. Now it might be a bacterium. So like E. coli, that's a single cell. A single E. coli is a single cell. We are two trillion plus cells, right? That work together as a community, as a multicellular organism. What's much smaller, and in case you're wondering, viruses are way smaller than cells, but they're not living. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Viruses are sort of a crazy thing to think about because they're not living, but they're able to take over our cells. Absolutely, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's funny, viruses are kind of like a genome in search of a cell. Ah. Because they have no way to manufacture their own materials, their proteins, etc. but they have the informational archive. They have a nucleic acid genome, yeah. but they need all the machinery of a cell. So they're evolved. Once they get in, they take over all the most of the machinery to actually build more of themselves. They're really nefarious in that regard. They really are. One last question. Do invertebrates have the same muscle structure as what we saw in that animation? Very similar. Yes. Yes. So that whole sliding filament um, th um, model does work as well. Yes. Yes. I find. The, and the actual structural arrangement at the gross level will be somewhat different um, depending on which invertebrate you're, you're talking about. But this sliding filament model of contracting things and then relaxing them and then contracting them um, is widely distributed throughout life. So pretty much all, all animals will have some version of this. Oh yes, 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 absolutely. And even cells themselves that crawl, like the ones I showed you, they don't have what I, what I showed you, but they have a related format to mm -hmm. it. Once again, using myosin and using actin, which are the two proteins that are particularly important to these filaments. Yeah. Now, I, I did want to keep our time um, close to 20 minutes, um, but we have we have so many good Too questions. <laughs> Too late. No, of course, I'm more than happy to take more. It's, it's up to you guys. <laughs> uh, we're going to do three more because we just had a couple come in that were really great. So I'm just going to fire three questions at you real quick, and then we'll wrap up. So um, how many types of cells are there? Livy wants to know. Is it uncountable? A different variety of cells? Oh, um, so I would say in the human body, so here's, here's one way to, to bound that a little bit. In the human body, there are somewhere between 200 and 250 different cell types. So, and when you think of different cell types, you can think about, you know, you know the endothelial cells that line your blood vessels. You can think about your nerve cells, the neurons that, that, that make up your brain. So there are about 200 to 250 different cell types in the human body. If we expand that out, though, to all the different cell types oh, yeah. in yeah. multicellular organisms, mm -hmm. but then if we start to add in, don't forget, plants are made up of cells, 
bacteria are cells, fungi are cells. Um, I'd say there's, we, I could probably come up with a number sequence if we parse single cell species from multicellular species, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Because so, if you think about it, humans are just one type of multicellular organism, just one type of animal. And yeah. we have 200 to 250 different cell types. So wow. that's kind of amazing to think oh, about. And by the way, I should, I should be accurate. That's not counting the bacteria. Ooh, good now, point. If you're, good don't news. forget, I, I, we're covered in bacteria. We have lots of bacteria inside of us. In strictly speaking, if you were to count up the individual cells, we have more bacterial cells than human cells. <laughs> and so um, anyway, I know that some of you were grossed out that we have our own cells crawling around. You may not want to think about <laughs> other cells that we are crawling around. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, another quick question. Do cells look different as we get older? Can you tell us one's age by looking at their scales under a microscope? Ah, that's a really interesting question. Question. So we tend to think about ourselves as getting older, but also our individual cells that don't die um, will also get older. They do age. So, um, so, so when I teach my students at the university about aging, there's aging at the cellular level, and there's mm -hmm. aging at the systemic level, at the physiological level. So what, what often happens with our organs, for example, our organs are regenerated and they maintain sort of their ability to function properly because those cells are replaced. So your mm -hmm. liver cells, your kidney cells, etc., are replaced because they wear out over time and their stem cells that continue to reproduce that actually regenerate new um, kidney tissue, new liver tissue. So the kidneys that I have now, if I look at them cell by cell, are not the same kidneys that I had no, 10 years ago. Absolutely not. That's and actually the surface of your skin changes over, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think one thing, your stem cells become exhausted over time. Mm. And what that means is that they're no longer able to regenerate. As we age, that becomes more and more of a problem. And there are features of our cells that tend to show that we're a that those cells are aging. So the question was, can you see it in a microscope? And you actually can. So for example, if you think about the endothelial cells that were crawling, a healthy young endothelial cell has lots of extensions mm -hmm. and they're able to crawl. As those cells age, they actually contract a little bit. They mm -hmm. tend to look smaller. And if you stain them for certain um, enzymatic markers, you'll start to see more and more of those enzymes in their cytoplasm. That's kind of a characteristic of aging. Mm -hmm. there's, also, there's also something called telomeres that you can look for, the, which are the, the ends of chromosomes, and they tend to shorten as we age. And you can also, uh, actually stain for your telomere length and number and see how aged a cell might be based on that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think, and to, to everyone who's continuing to ask really great questions in the chat, I will just say we are going to have more chats with scientists. So stay tuned and come back in future Fridays. And Dr. Liu, um, we would love to have you back on again as well, because we could talk about- I would love to. This is great fun. Longer. Yeah. The very last question I'll ask, because it has popped up again and again, is what is your favorite animal? The kids really want to know. Do you have a favorite animal? Or do you have any pets? So I am one of the saddest things in the world, which is someone that loves animals and loves pets, and I don't have any. Oh. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, well, prior to the um, lockdown, where we're all staying at home, I travel a lot. And so, you know, I didn't feel like I could leave pets at home and really worry about them for such. <laughs> but, but as a child, I grew up with a menagerie of different pets. I mean, I have to say that in terms of a domestic situation, I'm a dog person. I so, absolutely, absolutely love dogs. But in terms of, of animals that are really out there in the wild, I kind of go from one animal to another over time. These days, I'm particularly in love with meerkats. Oh, meerkats mm. are the cute. I love meerkats. They're super cute. They're social behavior. Yeah. It's really interesting as a societal structure. 
they're really amazing. So I'm really into meerkats these days <laughs> in terms of wild animals. Those are excellent choices. To everyone watching in the chat, please give some claps and just, you know, heart emojis and thank you to Dr. Lou for coming on and joining us today. Rob, this has just been amazing. I've learned my, so much. My pleasure. It's been delightful to talk with you and I hope that we will see you again soon. Absolutely. Well, thank thanks you so much. Yeah, your, your an animations are amazing, so keep it up. Oh, and one, one last thing. I'll just give another plug real quick to those who are watching. If you would like to see more animations, like what um, Rob shared with us, you can go to labexchange.org and it's a free platform, amazing videos and lessons there that you can check out. All right, we'll see you later. Bye.